According to a November 2011 article published by usatoday.com, there are over 200,000 veterans which suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder in the United States. Over 3,000 veterans seek help each month, but how many get the help they need? Joshua P. Eisenhower, All-American, All the Way. Shortly after the terrorist attacks of September 11, 2001, decided he wanted to join the military. After researching his options and obtaining his associate's degree, he joined the 82nd Airborne four years later in the summer of 2005. When he enlisted, he was assured of quick advancement through the ranks, and that if anything should happen, injury-wise, he would be taken care of. After enlisting, Joshua served two tours in Afghanistan fighting for the U.S. Although receiving an injury requiring surgery during his first tour, Joshua quickly returned to his unit and full duties. While there, he, like so many others, witnessed the atrocities of war. Regaining consciousness after a truck bomb went off and going outside to organize a search for pieces of two buddies that had been blown up. The smell of burning flesh. Being trapped on a rooftop with 500 pounders going off on both sides. Seeing two of your own blown up, knowing that could have been you. These things are too much for anyone to take. After witnessing these things firsthand, Joshua started suffering from severe anxiety, a symptom of PTSD. Former Staff Sergeant Ryan Mitchell recalls, On the first tour to Afghanistan, Staff Sergeant Joshua Eisenhower, who we call Ike, was the team's M249 saw gunner and breechman when entering compounds. He was the glue that held the squad together. For the second tour, we were stationed at a tiny base in Afghanistan. It was a nightmare of suicide bombers, mortars, rockets, and small arms fire. On a second tour, after the truck bombing, Joshua began guarding the barracks at night while the others slept. His primary objective was the safety of his men. Former Staff Sergeant Mitchell also recalls, while sharing an apartment with Ike after our last deployment, I saw him suffer from nightmares and lack of sleep. The hypervigilance he exuded became increasingly worse, causing Ike to stay up for days at a time. Panic attacks and anxiety were endured frequently. We all failed Ike. He was left living alone with no one to stand guard so he could sleep. The camaraderie of the soldiers in the unit becomes closer than that of brothers. Already suffering a fragile mental state, the discovery of a soldier who had just hanged himself caused Joshua to become even more anxious and irate. Joshua didn't feel like that he could protect his men. His anxiety, hypervigilance, and nightmares when he did sleep became so bad that he sought help during his second deployment. The Army's answer? Suppress the symptoms with benzodiazepines so Joshua could continue his tour of combat. But was this the right choice? In a medical document released in April 2012 by the Department of the Army, it's quoted that benzodiazepines now carry a D-level recommendation for both PTSD and acute stress disorder and should be avoided, and that the harm outweighs benefits. It continues, although benzodiazepines have been frequently used as needed, there is evidence to suggest they may actually potentiate the acquisition of fear response and worsen recovery from trauma. Benzodiazepines are also highly addictive. The document states, once initiated in combat veterans, benzodiazepines can be very difficult, if not impossible, to discontinue. To put this simply, in the long term, benzodiazepines could increase PTSD symptoms, not decrease them, and therefore should be avoided. So why then was this soldier placed on it for two years? And what would be the ramifications of this? Okay, 911, tell me what's going on. Yeah, I live on the 
an apartment complex, there was a fire the next door. The fire department and the police station came, but the guy would not come in through the door, so they busted in the door. January 13th, 2012. Members of the Fayetteville, North Carolina Police and Fire Departments arrive at Joshua's apartment in response to a complaint around 10 p.m. Yeah, this is the emergency. This is the county with the transfer. I just CT'd the call over. He's at 1127 Cape Harbor Court. Uh, we just found, we just found the, the, the people that own that apartment and that they have it, they're put, they have it put out with their barn being put. 911, what's the address of the emergency? Hey, I am over at Austin Creek Apartments. I'm the property manager. Um, I wanted to let you guys know some information if y'all need it, who it is in the apartment. Okay. His name is Joshua Eisenhower. Okay, is there a particular reason why you think he might be firing a shot? Uh, yeah, because he is under psychiatric care and he is not well. With the knowledge that the property manager had been called over with the keys and that the fire, which was actually outside on the back deck, was already extinguished with no sign of fire or smoke. It's questioned as to why it was felt necessary to break down the door and forcibly enter. When they did, Joshua instinctively resisted, believing he was under attack in Afghanistan. He was having a PTSD-induced war flashback that was being amplified by the medication he was on. A neighbor later told reporters, when the firemen were trying to bust down his door, the building shook. It was like the whole building was coming down. Joshua, in his mind, was under attack. Still there? Mm -hmm. Okay. I hear people talking. Where? Outside. Outside in the back of your building? I can't tell if it's the back of the briefway. This talking the lady could hear was Joshua giving orders to his soldiers. Soldiers he was trying to save. Soldiers that weren't there except in his flashback reality. Gunfire was exchanged early in the incident. The last few hours, Joshua was barricaded in his apartment, bleeding out in the kitchen. The whole time, Joshua believing he was in Afghanistan, being fired upon by insurgents. By the time the standoff was over, Joshua had been shot four times, his face being damaged by two bullets, one still being stuck in his jaw. While it is very fortunate Joshua harmed no one in this incident, the district attorney in Fayetteville is still prosecuting the criminal complaint and has been holding him in jail since January 13th. At the time of the incident, Joshua was active duty military in the Warrior Transition Battalion at Fort Bragg, North Carolina, where he was being treated for post-traumatic stress disorder and traumatic brain injury, as well as back and shoulder injuries. Therefore, Joshua's family and attorney have urged the Army to take jurisdiction over Joshua's case, so he continues to receive treatment while awaiting trial before a military tribunal. Under military jurisdiction, Joshua will be able to continue medical treatment for his PTSD and physical wounds received while serving his country in combat, and for wounds received during his active duty treatment in the Warrior Transition Program in Fayetteville. Currently, his medical care is negligent and mental health care is non-existent. The Army has agreed to take jurisdiction over Joshua's case, but only if William West, Cumberland County District Attorney, approves the transfer. This is the only way Joshua can get the specialized medical treatment he needs, which is only available in the military. Joshua's family and friends are encouraging support and asking for transfer of jurisdiction of Joshua's case to the Army. This is an American that needs help an American who fought and was wounded for this country. In the words of former Staff Sergeant Ryan Mitchell, having the Army take jurisdiction over Staff Sergeant Eisenhower's case will show the world that we are committed to. No soldier left behind. <laughs>